Hi, I'm Pat Gunn, and this is a webcast that I'm taking on the 24th of January, 2017. I've not taken one of these for some time, so to a certain extent, this is just to keep a continu uh, continuity of perspective over the years. I think the last one I did was, uh, it was in 2015. And at least a fair number of things have happened with the world since then, so I thought that I would uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, so I think I'll start with my thoughts on the recent election, which I don't think had even started at the time that I took the last video, or at least not to my recollection. Um, we ended up having in the United States an election that, as I see it, was between two incredibly unpopular uh, candidates. And there have been records, uh, or rather, there's a, a rather interesting story. Uh, of, uh, probably it's best to say that there are statistics that demonstrate the unusual fact of how unpopular both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton were coming into the election. And, um, yeah, the, the level of unpopularity of both of them was uh, unprecedented in recent elections. And so from this we can reasonably infer that most of the votes for both of them were, or at, at least we can reasonably believe that many more of the votes for both of them were against the, the other rather than for them. And that presumably... Republicans and a lot of moderates were opposed to Hillary, and Democrats and a lot of moderates were uh, opposed to Donald Trump. And, I mean, they both of them have, uh, have and had uh, a fair number of supporters as well, but the degree to which supporters dominated both sides of the election was significantly less than one would expect for a presidential election. And this resulted in a unusual election. Uh, there still were the popular vote and the actual results of the election were quite different. And uh, as a result, we saw a president who had lost the popular vote by, I think, over 2 million votes uh, or we saw the candidate who had lost the popular vote uh, by over 2 million votes, uh, still because of the quirks and how each uh, state, um, how many ele uh, electors they get in the Electoral College, uh, uh, Trump ended up winning. And I'm not so bothered with the, uh, by this because this is, we, we knew how the rules worked going into the election. Uh, and they might not be the best rules, but there are some benefits to having an electoral college. And while the election really didn't go the way that I had wanted, I can't say that I really like the idea of Hillary as Clinton either. I really dislike both Trump and Hillary. Uh, I am more bothered by Trump than I am uh, by Hillary, and that Basically, to me, Hillary represented a boring and corrupt establishment. And the degree to which it was corrupt, it's not like something is corrupt or not. It's the degree to which it's corrupt. And so Hillary had a lot of fairly modern, boring views that most of the politicians in Washington, regardless of their party, hold. And... I found a lot of her attitudes bothersome. I found the way that she conducted herself in the election uh, inexcusable, and so I didn't vote for her. I didn't vote for Trump either. Uh, I find Trump to be horrifying in, to a much greater degree than almost any politician that we can imagine being elected. Despite my supporting him on a few of his unorthodox positions, the vast majority of them strike, strike me as either uh, repre reprehensible or unimplementable 
the unimplementable, yeah, unimplementable, not an easy word to pronounce. Um, and the, the people that he surrounded himself with strike me as being generally incompetent. Uh, his defects in personality are well outside the scope of what you would ex uh, expect or want in any national leader. And I feel they also pose a certain danger to the nation. Uh, his and and some of the some of the differences that he has between the the main established views are just uh, they're more striking in their difference than in their specifics. Uh, for example, for a long time, the United States has gone for a more friendly friendly relationship with China. I mean, uh, it's friendly to a certain extent. It's that they're kind of a known problem, but they're also a major trading partner. So it's in our economic interest to be relatively friendly with them. They also are a very powerful nation, and it is helpful to have good relationships with such an influential uh, world power. While our relationship with Russia, because it is largely a declined power that doesn't matter so much in legitimate senses anymore. We've chosen to not have such a necessarily friendly or indulgent relationship with them. And in particular, we've seen them ship, uh, or we've seen them slip over the last 10 years from being a nation that held a lot of promise in terms of dealing with its issues with corruption and becoming a more civilized nation uh, that allows for political difference, allows for open political criticism, and allows for questioning if it's powerful to being an increasingly centralized and past-looking nation. And so we've by, by choosing to not be necessarily positive with them, uh, positive towards them in most of the things that they do, uh, we've been trying to, uh, at least in much more recent times, look at containing them uh, with the hopes that, uh, that, that they will either turn around on, their, uh, on, their, on how they use power or at least that we can minimize the harmful impact that they have on the world. And so what Trump has done, particularly with his actions on Taiwan, which I actually, I have some sympathy towards, uh, towards that stance, uh, towards being more friendly with Taiwan uh, and not allowing China to dictate how all other powers in the world uh, relate to Taiwan. I think that that's a potentially positive thing if it's done carefully, deliberately, and thoughtfully. And I, I'm not convinced that Trump is necessarily doing it in that way, but I welcome the exploration of different views on that topic. But Trump is pivoting away from China and sees them as a major uh, geopolitical foe while he is choosing to have much more friendly relations with Russia. And I don't want more friendly relations with Russia. In particular, uh, they would have to end their occupation of Crimea uh, for us to even consider such a thing. And I would like to see more of a move towards democratic norms, unpredictable transfers of power, uh, credible multi-party uh, electoral systems, um, and less of a tie between political and economic power in Russia. If, if we were to think that they're really moving in directions that are healthy for the world, rather than being directions that centralize all economic and political power under their current leaders. And so I, I'm nervous about this shift but we can imagine a world where the United States had in, instead chosen to uh, 
to always push against um, China and to have been always more politically friendly with, uh, with Russia. And it wouldn't have been necessarily that different, except that China's a growing power and Russia is a fading power. Um, it's interesting to see, uh, or it will be interesting to see how uh, Trump's foreign policy towards despotic powers in the Middle East, such as Saudi Arabia, uh, how, how those relationships shift over time. But in general, uh, I'm very worried about what Trump has in plan for domestic power. I won't. I, I don't think that his his government is illegitimate, even if we can credibly believe, and I think that we can, that the Russians had an interest and had undertaken activities to shape uh, American. Uh, uh, political belief, uh, both uh, both directly and through subterfuge. Um, in the end, I think we have to accept that in a in a democracy, when people vote, that that choice matters, even when we don't like the way that they vote. And in this case, I don't, but. I also think that the election, we knew that there was going to be a bad result when the field had narrowed down to Hillary and Trump. Uh, or at least people with views like me really don't like either of them. Whether we dislike one of them a whole lot more or not is kind of besides the point. Neither of them were likable. And uh, I don't feel that this is particularly just my views, again, based on, on those polls. Uh, but, but the election happened, and so we have a President Trump now. I think that it's healthy to have regular transitions of power here, between the parties, uh, to not have the same ideas pushing in our political sphere, to not have the same popular movements dominant in our political sphere. And I had hoped to have uh, seen the next loss by the Democrats and by the uh, liberals behind them to, to happen, but ideally not not with these specifics, and that I do think Trump is dangerous because of his incompetence, his uh, his character. Um, some of his policy promises are very worrying, and so I would have liked to have seen uh, liberal movements humbled uh, as they regularly have to be, just as conservative movements have to be humbled. But I would have liked to have seen the liberals humbled by more moderate conservatives, uh, or at least by somebody competent. Um, I don't think that we got quite quite the worst Republican uh, possible, and that I would would have been more worried to have seen Ted Cruz become president. I think he would have been a, a more worrying president, and a lot of with a lot of different specifics than what we're seeing with, with Trump, and that I believe that Cruz likely would have been more competent, but that his uh, political views and values would have been far more worrying. Whereas here we just got get a kind of crazy guy who's not a person of ideas, who's surrounding himself with incompetence, and we kind of get to see him flail around for, uh, for a time, and we can expect that he probably won't get as much harm done, at least not harm in, in terms of the traditional liberal conservative uh, value schisms, but we will see instead the different set of harms coming from sheer incompetence. And my bet 
is that the sheer incompetence is less harmful than having somebody who is competent but who is uh, whose values are anathema to at, at least what what we've been trying to build uh, slowly through this back and forth over the decades um, that we would have seen with Cruz. We're we're not seeing that. It's yeah, again, it's still worrying. But at the same time, both the, the conservative and the liberal movements that are kind of on both sides of the two main parties, they have to be humbled on a regular basis. Otherwise, they do crazy things, they believe crazy things, and they think that everybody is behind them, and they never understand the sides that are not behind them. That they never understand the concerns that are not met by uh, by their parties, uh, either either in reality or in terms of what what kinds of attention get paid to various issues. And I'm not actually so worried about the Democratic Party. To a certain extent, they demonstrated themselves to uh, be corrupt. Um, at least to not be particularly, uh, not to be particularly democratic, not not in terms of of their own values, but in terms of actually respecting the process of choosing who is their nominee. Uh, the, but apart from that, and apart from the officials involved in that, which admittedly involved Hillary Clinton, Debbie Wasserman Schultz and a lot of the other party apparatus. Uh, but the party mechanisms itself, uh, the party mechanisms themselves didn't prove themselves to be completely bankrupt. They, by and large, did the normal thing. And uh, they probably should have been smarter about deciding, uh, to the extent that they even decided to, to pick who was going to win the nomination, they should have insisted that somebody not so um, unpopular be the person. And I, I I'm, I'm expect that parties will have preferences as to who who becomes their, uh, their flag bearer as they enter elections. It would have been nice to have seen more flexibility. Uh, with that, it would be nice to see superdelegates go away. But they still chose somebody who uh, who is just not a particularly popular uh, popular person among the Amer uh, among the American public. Largely, I believe, because it uh, it was seen as her turn. Uh, her turn. She had gone through. She had basically climbed the expected social ladders and put in her time at various levels, and and she thought that that meant that she deserved to be the nominee. And uh, she and the party apparatus agreed, despite her unpopularity, and so she became the nominee. And and that's kind of once that became true then at least from the view of a lot of people, we were guaranteed at least a somewhat bad result. And the Republican process, it, it suffered from not being able to have credible ways to weed out bullshit. And so you ended up having a showy populist who lied all the time um, and who didn't debate on issues, who didn't have any big ideas, um, at, at least didn't have any big policy ideas. He, he had big populist ideas that were largely gimmicks, and we're going to see them... Uh, and, and, and we're going to see many of those gimmicks not work out as well as he painted them working out. But we don't we never saw 
policy ideas that were technocratic, that were designed primarily to be effective rather than showy. Uh, because such things are boring, and being a showman at heart and a reality TV showman at heart, you don't focus on the boring stuff, and you don't have to develop ideas. And so he doesn't have them. He's not a person of ideas. He's not the kind of person who has ideas. But he was able to win, and nobody called him out on the mountain of bullshit that pushed him to victory. And there were no credible challengers that were strong enough in slapping him down. And despite effectively losing every debate against Hillary Clinton, she somehow didn't manage to demonstrate enough that she was a better candidate than him. Uh, and so she lost. I can't say that either of them deserved to win, but we ended up electing uh, some somebody like Trump, and that's very disappointing uh, to me, at, at least significantly, because I think that regardless of who we elect, we need good governance. And admittedly, I, I liked Sanders. I never thought that he was particularly electable, but it would have been nice to have seen somebody who had broad appeal, who had a chance of being elected, uh, who actually didn't have the political problems that Hillary entered in, have somebody better running on the Democratic side. And we didn't. Would have been nice to have seen Elizabeth Warren run. Um, it would have been nice probably to see Biden run. I don't trust Biden on foreign policy, but I think he would have, he's a lot more likable than Hillary. I mean, same, same thing with same thing with almost uh, anybody. You just need somebody who your eyes did not slide off them and forget them the moment that they're off camera. And there were, I think, two or three other people running deeply forgettable people uh, on, the, on the Democratic side, and that's unfortunate. I talked a little bit earlier about the need for both parties to be humbled occasionally. It's not really the parties, it's really more the activist movements that give the parties a certain amount of fire. Without being humbled, they're kind of crazy. And I think that the liberal movement uh, liberal movements, really, because it's never been only one movement. It needed to be humbled, and now that it's not running the show, we're seeing some of its kinds of crazy come out. And I think this is the perfect time to talk about the problems in those liberal movements because, because of all, uh, what's on display. It doesn't mean that it's the wrong time to talk about the craziness of the conservative movements either, but they're going to be dominant for the next four years, more or less. Um, and instead of... Actually, it's not their ideas that are going to be dominant so much as their administration. And I think that there's a, there's a distinction between... Uh, we essentially get to criticize different parts of... Uh, of each side when they're in power and when they're not in power. When they're in power, you get to judge them based on the strength of their ideas and their policy, how well things work. And there are weaknesses in that, and that a lot of policies take a while before they actually have an effect. But by and large, you get to judge the party when it's in power, and you get to judge the activists when they're not in power. And so now it's probably time to, to be looking at the, the strength of the ideas of the Republican Party. And I think it's time to judge the, the, uh, the movements of the... I'm sorry, I have a cat who's trying to sit in not a, not a great place uh, right now. Um, uh, incidentally, this is uh, Beefalo. This is one of my two cats. 
she, I think, is like 16 or 17 years old. And I only recently uh, rediscovered this when I went back through uh, my records for when, when I got her, because I was curious how old she and my other cat, Tortfeasor, actually are. And uh, I was actually pretty surprised to find out that she's uh, that old. I probably should have known. Um, anyhow, one of the problematic ideas, uh, I mean, there, there are a bunch of ideas that have become, become problematic in liberal activism recently, one of which is a greatly decreased commitment to free speech, not just as a uh, legal ideal, but also as a social ideal, in that some parts of the left have been very successful. Unfortunately, they've been very successful in businesses and conferences and a lot of the uh, private institutions of society in pushing bad ideas, uh, like the, the, the idea that there is such a thing as microaggressions, that they're a problem, and that they mean that people should be apologetic for offending each other and things like that. I think that's a really terrible idea, and I would like to see that idea stop in liberalism. I would like to see it crash and fail, and for businesses to stop paying attention to it, to stop worrying about it. I would like to see for conferences to stop having expansive notions of harassment that just mean, ooh, somebody is offended, um, uh, or somebody is marginalized or erased or something like that. I think it's very silly to worry about these things. Um, I am bothered as a non-straight person to have liberals claiming to represent non-straight people uh, and say that you have to worry about erasing us or offending us or correcting your terms or subscribe to gender theory or other uh, other things that I think are bollocks. Um, liberals need to cut that out. But also, there's a there's another idea that's come about, particularly near the election, that people have an obligation to vote Democrat. And they have an obligation to win, uh, and even not to speak in ways that could harm the likelihood of victory of the Democratic Party. And I think that this is a terrible idea, particularly when it bleeds over into the notion that we need to condemn people who didn't vote the way that we did. And I think part of what bothers me about this is it, it, there's a philosophical problem in that the one of the arguments that's typically, or the one of the chains, uh, the chains that you see when people are building, uh, building their reasoning for condemning people who don't vote a certain way, I mean literally condemning, like they're they're going to insist that the person admits that they're wrong, or they're not going to get along with them as people, is the notion that politics can be simplified. Uh, down to being around a few issues and that there are only a few ways to look at those issues and that there exist slam dunk arguments to compel people to vote a certain way or they're worthy of condemnation. Either they just don't get it, they're misinformed, or they're evil in some way, uh, or they're, they're stupid in some way. I, I just, I don't buy that. I think that Politics is a much more free-form exercise. There are many, many different ways, different lines of reasoning, different values, uh, different notions about what will probably happen tactically in the long run, different ways to, to frame concerns that make the realm of politics so free-form that you really can't effectively condemn anybody for their vote even in this election. Um, but but even, even more broadly, even when you have 
like uh, people who I think most of us would agree are pretty horrible, you're going to run into some people who support uh, Putin or Assad or, um, I mean, you, you can go pretty far and you can still find uh, sets of values, lines of reasoning that make voting for those people or people like them seem like a pretty good idea. And this is one of the reasons why I like religious people. I'm not a religious person. I think religion is nonsense on stilts. And I feel that I have some pretty good arguments for why people shouldn't be religious, why, uh, why it doesn't make sense, why it, it's devoting a big part of one's life and one's notion of what is true to things that are false and unreasonable to believe. But I don't think that the arguments that I can offer are slam dunk. And there are a bunch of really smart people out there, um, Jesuits, rabbis, imams, uh, and people of other faiths who can come up with lines of reasoning and ways that you begin to build the bridge to what they believe, that you put them together and they'll get you pretty much there. I can attempt to criticize some of those lines of reasoning, but I can't offer a slam dunk way to completely destroy them. I enjoy sparring as much as any other person with strong beliefs, but, uh, but I, I don't think I can condemn them for their conclusions. Uh, even though I think that those conclusions are, I pretty strongly believe those conclusions are wrong. And I don't think that every debate I'm going to be able to win. Uh, generally, if it, in any debate, or on even on any topic, if you end up with sufficiently intelligent, uh, well-informed people who have thought enough about the topic, they're going to be able to construct a pretty strong argument for why they believe what they believe. Because they, like anybody else who is smart enough and inclined enough to think carefully about issues, they're going to have a little debate factory in their head that's running continually. They'll have what they believe. They'll have arguments that come up and arguments against what they believe come up. And they'll be sparring inside their head. And, uh, and bad arguments will be knocked down, and stronger arguments will continue to be constructed for their side and against their side in their head. Very, very occasionally they might see uh, their way to a new, uh, new belief through this process. Or they might see their beliefs refined a little bit through this process. But it's rare that you're actually going to see everybody fall out of a set of beliefs through this process. Instead, they'll just end up with some really strong, hard-to-defeat arguments for what they believe. And in the long run, we can believe that debate will help shape populations in healthy ways. They'll at least reach the most intelligent form of their, their belief. But it's rare that you'll see a belief disappear entirely through this process, either in somebody's head or in proper debates between people. And so, as much as I am bothered by, by Trump, I don't think voting for him makes anybody racist or evil or problematic, and I, I'm going to be able to overlook politics all the time when I'm dealing with people, and I'm going to try my best whenever I'm discussing with people what my views are and what their views are to have a... Uh, civil discussion and to have a reasonable back and forth. And when they make points, I'll acknowledge them when the points feel strong. And I hope that we can even keep it friendly and it can be sparring, even when I think that the results of their vote taken alongside everybody else's vote are doing things that I consider harmful to our nation, to the world, things like that because in the end, we have a societal truce. And that truce permits us to have, as a society, diversity in the views that we have. It is healthy for us as a, as a society. 
um, that we don't have just one set of views, that we don't have just one political party or just one movement that's able to express itself and argue. And in the end, I think it has to... It, it promotes the diversity of ideas that I think is the right way to build notions of right and wrong. There are other ways to do it that the parties do that I think are terrible, such as looking at individual groups and deciding, oh, they're doing pretty well or they're not doing pretty well, and I like those groups or I don't like those groups, um, maybe for other reasons, maybe just because I think that they're not doing well, and so I'm going to look and just try and maximize their welfare and give up everything for the sake of those groups. I think that's a really bad way to build notions of justice. And unfortunately, there are some philosophers that I think have been pushing methods that uh, I'm maybe being a little bit unfair, but that boil down effectively to that, like Foucault. Um, and critical theory tends to do this a lot, in, in my experience. And I, I think good notions of justice instead come from strong ideas that ideally have a almost universal appeal. When you explain them to people, they scratch their head and say, you know, that's an interesting idea. And in the long run, they sink in, they start to change how we think about issues. And through a combination, through a negotiation of all these really interesting ideas that grab us, we build notions of justice. And so we, we approach issues through these notions. Um, Take, for example, a, an excess that has happened in liberal movements recently where you ended up having a, a person who is full of really terrible ideas, a conservative activist, and so somebody went up to him, as, uh, went up to him and clobbered him as, uh, uh, during a political event, and then they ran off. And I think that this was really terrible, not because he was part of some minority, because whether he's part of some minority or not is immaterial, and not, uh, and I don't think it really has anything to do with the views that he espoused, but rather I think that we have this idea that it is healthy in our nation to have a diversity of ideas. And, uh, and even if his ideas in particular were unhealthy, we should also have this idea that a just society doesn't condone people being clobbered for their ideas. And when activists decide, um, whatever their affiliation, to directly go after somebody because of their views and go after them with more than just words, then regardless of the, uh, of the views or not, we should condemn that. And so with the very same ideas that we use to condemn people who dox or threaten violence against feminist activists because of their occasionally right, occasionally, uh, occasionally wrong ideas that they're pushing, we should condemn the violence against, uh, against this person. But we're not seeing that so much, again, uh, from the flavors of activists that are instead deciding that his words make him a victimizer. And so we are striking out on behalf of the victims against somebody who is saying things that make somebody else a victim. And, uh, and so we have these two different perspectives. One is idea-based and looks at abstract notions of justice, which I think is the right way to approach these things. Yeah. Or you have the uh, you have the power analysis, and uh, and we're going to condone violence against somebody who is speaking in a way that we don't like, because we have to, uh, we have identified that person as a powerful person. Um, perhaps only powerful because they are part of a large uh, majority in some ways in society. And they're speaking in ways that offends, 
uh, people who claim to be speaking on behalf of less powerful people. And I think that that's the wrong way to approach these issues. It's not the only wrong way, and, and I don't think that the way that I describe as the right way is necessarily the only right way. But I think that these terms capture a, or, or these classifications capture a lot of the conceptual space for how we might approach these issues. Not meaning to discount the idea that there are other ways to approach these that are alien to both. And, um, and could be interesting ways to, uh, to think about this stuff. And so the ugliness of this, uh, this violence uh, as a way of meeting speech is a way which I'd, I'd like to see uh, brought into the light and ideally given the mainstream condemnation that it deserves so that it can be beaten out of, uh, of the flavors of activism that do it. And again, not because one side or the other is necessarily more wrong in this, but because the, the, these particular acts are problematic, whoever is doing them. And I am not meaning in general to say that both parties are equivalent. They're not. They have different specifics, but I am meaning to, to comment that problematic actions and problematic lines of reasoning should bother us whatever side they're on. And they should bother us when they flatter us. They should bother us when they don't flatter us. And we should be opposed to them in each case. Um, so those are my thoughts on some things relating to the election. Otherwise in life, uh, I've recently moved to Manhattan. Uh, what you're seeing here is the inside of my much smaller apartment in, uh, in Manhattan. It's in Chelsea. Uh, when I moved to New York City, I wanted to see what it would be like to live uh, in Manhattan. And it's actually surprisingly quiet here. Part of this is that I'm living kind of on the edge of the island in a not super exciting neighborhood. Um, but part of it, I think, is just that I had a bit of a misconception about what it would be like to live in Manhattan. Um, I thought that, uh, that even in the residential parts, there would be people around all the time. I suppose that's probably true for the neighborhoods that are right, right above bars. And, I, and I, I'm not claiming that New York City is necessarily... Living anywhere in Manhattan is different than living in most other parts of the country. In that you're still going to have access to 24-hour shops of various kinds that you're not going to see in many other cities. And during the daytime, the variety in what you can get within one or two blocks of your apartment is vast. It's probably bigger than in almost any other city in the world. And that's pretty cool. But it, it's not like li uh, always living above a party or anything like that, which is probably a good thing. It would probably be pretty distracting living in that kind of environment. Um, it's still possible to be lonely in New York City. It's still possible to uh, construct a life that has almost any flavor that you want, apart from like rugged wilderness or anything like that. Um, but you have access to a whole lot of material to build a social life. Um, and there are events going on all the time. There are places uh, that you can go with endless variety for restaurants. There are meetups and things like that, but there's not, uh, but there's still a fair amount of quiet if, if you look for it. 
and it's not too hard to get out of the city, particularly if you're in Manhattan. Um, you still have access to like beaches and Brooklyn and Queens, uh, and you can go pretty far out in the boroughs to get uh, less uh, less densely populated areas. But um, but yeah, it's it's just generally been been eye opening. I think I'm finding out some of what I was wondering when I moved to New York City like what it would be like to, to live in Manhattan and has its appeal. It, it's also very expensive. Um, I'm not sure a year and a half from now uh, when this lease is up, whether I'll be renewing or moving to another part of Manhattan or may, maybe moving to a different borough. I think it's kind of unlikely that I'll be leaving New York City as a whole because there's a certain addictiveness in having this very high population density, but who knows. Uh, but this feels like I'm I'm getting what I moved here for. Like the experiment is actually underway for what I was curious about when I moved here. There's also something about living in a New York apartment where you actually are thinking about uh, every cubic foot of space so much. Um, in past apartments, and in past cities, certainly, I had a whole lot of stuff that I didn't really keep track of so much. Um, and here I have a pretty good idea of just about everything I have because I uh, have, through a series of subsequent moves, thrown out almost everything that didn't feel kind of important. And I still have a whole lot, a whole lot of stuff, and I might like keep doing this winnowing process but uh, but uh, but yeah it's it shifted how how much stuff I have considerably and how aware I am of what is important to keep considerably and so like if I were right now to move into one of the bigger uh, bigger rental places that I ever had everything would probably fit in the living room like everything I have. And that, that's interesting to think about. And maybe at some point later in my life, I'll actually want to have a whole lot of space again and have separate rooms that have devoted purposes. Like here um, in my apartment, I have, it's a, it's a studio with a loft above it. And the loft is not a full featured loft because the ceiling there is about four and a half feet tall. And you can see stairs behind, or a ladder behind me that leads up there. Uh, I don't sleep up there. I basically use it as an extended closet. I could sleep up there if anybody came to visit, since they would probably get the couch that I normally sleep on. Um, but in the past, I had like, uh, the biggest apartment I had was half of a duplex and it was the duplex was the, was a three-story house with a very large basement and I just had so much space there probably more space than I needed like some of the rooms were almost empty uh, but I had a computer room uh, I had an, a separate office um, the upper room I uh, it was just kind of an extended bedroom it was huge and I probably will never have that again. Like, even if I move to another city, I probably won't ever find use for that and this end up with a big family, which is looking a little bit unlikely at this point uh, at my age, but you never know. Uh, but, uh, but it would be nice at some point to have more space again, maybe have a yard. But that would mean either leaving New York City or at least moving to the outer parts of it. Some of my coworkers uh, do that. Like they commute in from upstate New York or New Jersey, where they actually have houses and yards. And I'm sure some of them live in outer Queens, where it's possible to do that too, like standalone structures. And and even in cities like like Pittsburgh, uh, which are much less dense, you have to go a ways out if you want to have a sizable yard. 
or you have to be in one of the really non-dense parts of, of town. But usually you're, you're going to be moving uh, kind of outside the city, and that means you're probably going to have a car. Um, whereas here in New York City, I don't have a car. I don't need a car. I don't want a car. Um, so it's it's an adjustment. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad to have uh, to have this time in my life where I'm experiencing living in a very high density environment with all the pluses and minuses that come uh, from that. Um, so is there anything else I want to talk about? I guess I might want to, provided that I get back in the habit, uh, to the extent that ever was in the habit of doing these, I might do a few more gaming videos because I now have a pretty kick-ass gaming system. Um, I bought it uh, this past summer because I realized that, like, for most of my life, my gaming system was always just mediocre. And so I was always playing, like, with mid-graphics quality on, um, like, a 1440 by, um, uh, what is it, like, 1024? Uh, that's not quite the... Yeah, there are standard resolutions, and I can't quite remember. It is pretty late at night, admittedly. Was it 1440 by 900 or whatever that standard uh, resolution is? Um, I was typically playing at that resolution with mid-level graphics quality, and I thought it would be nice at least once in my life to have a really kick-ass system, so I dropped about 5k on a very high-end gaming rig. And so I, I have a system where I could probably play the latest games in pretty high res and uh, probably stream them to YouTube because I did uh, a few Let's Plays in the past and they were fun and it would be neat to do that again. Um, and of course it would be nice to occasionally talk about philosophy, politics, uh, anything else that would turn turn out uh, interesting to talk about. I guess I could talk about gaming. Uh, I am kind of excited to see Disgaea 5. Um, uh, the, the remake coming to... Uh, generally, so Disgaea, it's a series um, organized, it's like a tile-based strategy game uh, where uh, like each side takes turns doing a whole bunch of motion for a whole bunch of units. It's kind of like Final Fantasy Tactics Advance in, in some ways. Um, and, and so I really like the sense of humor in Disgaea. I like the characterizations. Um, and generally, Nipponichi will, uh, the publishers of the series, they'll do uh, one release on one platform, and then in an, uh, on some other gaming platform, they'll do a uh, another release that takes all of the paid DLC and includes it. And they'll do that maybe like a year or two after the initial release. So typically, I'm, I'm going to wait, because in general, I think it's right to be, or it's wise to be patient in terms of when you watch a movie, when you decide to play a game. You don't have to be and generally shouldn't be aiming to get it immediately when it's released. Like That's kind of the sucker's way of doing it. You're going to enjoy it just as much six months down the line, and you'll probably pay less for it, and you'll be playing a less buggy, um, less buggy product at that point. So I usually wait. Uh, and... So they're finally doing this for Disgaea 5. And I think that they're doing it for a... Um, there's a new gaming uh, platform by Nintendo. I don't quite remember its name at the moment. Um, it's a semi-portable system. Uh, there's maybe two or three games that look interesting uh, on it to me now. And when the time is right, I'll get, get that system and probably get Disgaea 5, get that Mario game... Uh, that looks kind of like a newer, fancier cousin to Super Mario 64, which was a really great game. And there'll probably be a few other good games available for it at the time, too. Uh, I think there was a Zelda game that also looked uh, pretty good. I'm realizing I'm probably not the right person to excite people about talking about games, because I don't remember the specifics. But I'm okay with that. I just remember being 
kind of excited about some things that are coming up. I did really enjoy Dishonored 2. I am enjoying Civilization uh, 5. And uh, I, I enjoyed uh, Fallout 4 a lot. And oh, it was Civilization 6, not Civilization 5. Uh, that I, I've been enjoying. Um, and actually part of part of uh, part of some of these recent games that I've really enjoyed has been the music. But uh, but yeah, I, I have a, a rake where I could play through these games and do let's plays and I might do that. Um, part of the thing that inspired me to do another video here is that there were a few comments on an old video that I did I think like two years ago and they reminded me, yeah, I did videos in the past and Actually, I have a few things to talk about now, so let's do it. Um, I'm, I'm not really in it to get lots of followers or anything like that, but it, it, just, it can be interesting to express oneself uh, this way. I've also been looking into bringing back some old web comics that I did some time back, um, maybe doing some, uh, some more classes again, because teaching is always fun even though organizationally it's kind of a drag. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to get back into some of these things as a way to be a little bit uh, less focused on work and have other things going on in my life. So hopefully I'll be doing some more of these videos soon. Who knows? Um, but I think for now I'm going to sign off because it's about 2.55 a.m. right now and... Uh, I'm, I'm about to hit the one hour mark and also I'm uh, getting kind of tired and I, as usual, need to be up at a reasonable hour to get to work tomorrow. And even ending, ending this at this point almost guarantees that I'll be tired for most of the day. Um, take care. If you have any comments, I would be happy to address them in a future video or if you have any ideas, any topics you would like me to talk about anything in history, anything in the sciences, uh, because there's always really cool stuff going on in the sciences. Uh, I'm happy to talk about that stuff. If not, I'll just talk about whatever comes to mind whenever I get to it.